Hello and welcome. My name is Richard Miller. Never Not Here is beaming at you again, and we're having a discussion. And uh, so much is happening in our nation, so much is happening in the world, so much is happening in our lives. And uh, I think sometimes it pays to call attention to that. And uh, so today we're, we're with uh, two friends. We're trying something a little different. And, and uh, so please help me welcome Christine Wuschke. Hi, Christine. Hello. And uh, Michael, uh, 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 we have Michael here. Is your last name Hedman? Yes, it is. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for being here today. And uh, I don't know, you know, uh, I'm kind of an onlooker. Uh, a lot of times I look over people's shoulders and seeing, seeing what seems to be happening. And um, I say that because I don't really know what's happening. Uh, I'm not trying to be coy or cautious or trying to say things are arising or, or there's no person here or uh, I use all the jargon that uh, our type of audience uh, seems to like to hear sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, but really what I'm saying is that uh, sometimes it looks like uh, uh, there's nothing to do and uh, and somehow that that knowing or that believing takes energy away from um, so-called projects that we might want to get involved in. And then we have no energy for it. And we, and we can just say honestly that uh, there's no interest here uh, to involve in that part of society or, or those so-called problems or uh, you know, what, what's really happening in the world. And uh, actually, uh, a lot of people say something like everything is right for this moment. Uh, and they even go farther and say it's perfect, which just means it is to me. I mean, uh, what isn't uh, isn't here, and what is is here. But I don't know about the perfection of it. But I don't know. Do you hear, th Christine? Do you hear things like that uh, from uh, seekers or from other uh, people that uh, are involved in uh, in uh, clarity clarity teachings? Should we call it? Mm -hmm. So, like, do you mean do I hear the question? should I do or not do, or, or do you mean more that? What does it mean? What does it mean, do or not do? Anyhow, if there's no doer, then there's no not doer either. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Personally, I think it's just the way that it's being experienced. So if sometimes, and maybe you have this experience too, like sometimes it's just all, it's all so effortless and it's just happening. And that's the, that's the experience. So it's like I'm getting in my car and I'm driving down the street and, oh, this is all just happening. And then there's times where that same action can feel like effort or wading through mud and really nothing's changed. So where's that perception coming from that I'm wading through mud or I'm, I'm putting in all this effort? Right. So I, I mean, it happens all the time, right? Because uh, just tie your shoes, you know, there's no doer, right? <laughs> it's just happening. Yeah. <laughs> but what's the big deal about it? Well, I think it's the, the thing that's making it a big deal is the same as the thing that makes it feel like you're wading through mud, like the whatever that mechanism is that says this is a really big deal and I'm going to put a whole bunch of pressure on the situation and make sure it turns out the way that I want it to turn out. That, that pressurization is, I guess, in my opinion, where it would feel like an effort rather, if it's not a big deal to you, if it's something's not a big deal to me, it's just, it just is, which is like you were saying, same as saying it's perfect. <laughs> as soon as I make it a big deal and I project that, I put that label on top of it that this is important, then, well, then it, it becomes a big deal. So now it feels like I've got it put all this effort into it. What's Make your take on it, Michael? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm much in line with that. That is my experience as well. Uh, it just is, or uh, there's no big deal. Uh, that might sound a little glib or trivial, but it's actually quite profound. It's almost as if a great equalization occurs. 
uh, and that could be another way of saying that all things are perfect uh, not to be and detached from from what we're doing or what we care about but things take on the same value um, isn't so that a me, kind of, isn't that a kind of a detachment if everything has the same value it, it probably could be it could be something that you pull away from which of course would be unfortunate and a bit of a temporary trap I think like a spiritual face but I think you could also hear it the complete other way around so the uh, it could be a complete attachment um, that everything is equalized. You fully drop, drop into it. Uh, that's what I'm noticing for myself. You started speaking of the events that are occurring. Uh, may it be Occupy Wall Street or other such you know, contemporary events. And I've had an interesting thing happening just the uh, last uh, day or two. Because uh, surprisingly, I felt so alienated from that whole movement. And yet, of course, everyone who is the least bit conscious uh, care about reforming our systems and our you know, businesses and marketplaces uh, because they are unhealthy. Uh, but yet, I've, I've really not been able to uh, uh, identify or, or, or care for these protesters up until the other day uh, when I was exposed to a lot of them, their arguments and so forth. And, and some pieces fell into place inside. And without going into detail uh, what, what that involved, it feels as if things are becoming part of me. So the whole expression of this Occupy Wall Street had been out there, something that I felt alienated with. And all of a sudden, all those activities are now part of me which does not mean that I have to personally engage or, or you know, spend time uh, joining uh, those protesters. It just feels as if it's completely integrated. What goes on is just part of me. It's amazing, um, you know, because you hit a direct bullseye because, I mean, maybe the, my idea to, was to bring this whole conversation about Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Chicago. And what town did you, uh, did you go see some people or, or do you live next to one of those uh, uh, demonstrations or clo close to? Not really. I, I've just followed it, uh, not even followed it very carefully in the news. But we have our own square here in the little town that I'm living in. And, and there are a handful of people there. And frankly, they were upsetting me. I, I was quite alienated from the whole guitar playing, uh, you know, hippie uh, flavor that the movement has. Of course, it also has all kinds of diverse people involved with it. But that was how my biased view related to it. Of course, reflecting a lot of what goes on inside of me. Uh, so when I, when I dropped into that and, and willingly exposed myself to the demonstrators. I, I just sat on a park bench, a park bench in the midst of it up until uh, there was no longer that split feeling of, of antagonism. Um, something just dropped down inside and, and um, not that it has to be that way, but I, I gained a full appreciation of everything that goes on. <clears throat> Neither labeling it as something that is valuable and profound nor dismissing it it's just something that goes on uh, so in that sense again tying back to what we spoke of earlier it's a perfect equalization it just goes on uh, and um, I feel it as if it's part of my body or my grander system so uh, I feel harmonized with it that's that's all said a lot of things there that I kind of wanted to comment on. I'm, I'm kind of losing them and gaining them. But uh, in this strict sense that we sometimes speak, uh, things are equalized and, and, uh, and nothing is really an opportunity in that, in that kind of a, I don't even want to call it a belief structure because if we, somehow we have an experience that uh, everything is happening by itself with like, I just said tie your shoes, but so many things. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we could just say, well, uh, then opportunity doesn't exist, really. It's an opportunity for a tied shoe, right? I mean, uh, so then you can't say it's, you can't judge it and say it's uh, uh, valuable or 
or it's not valuable, it's a risk, you know. A bunch of people that mm, don't know anything about our economy are getting out there to mess around with it, uh, or try, you know, or whatever the risk could be. But I mean, uh, I I could see that somehow I I see it as a tremendous potential. But I don't know. Can we even say that? I mean. Uh, a strict non-dualist wouldn't even say something like that, would they? <laughs> I'm totally not a non-dualist, so I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you say? Do you have uh, Occupy up in Canada? <laughs> <laughs> have you followed Occupy, Christine? What's that? This uh, movement is called Occupy, I think. Uh, most of the mm -hmm. towns uh, gave up on Wall Street and they just said Occupy Pittsburgh. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually haven't really been following it all that much. I mean, every once in a while I'll see a, like a protest sign that I really like and it's like, wow, I really dig that sign. But I, ha I don't really know what's going on. I haven't really been following it. So um, but when I was listening to Michael talk, I, I actually really liked what he was saying about the equalization because... I mean, that's, th this is life in the 21st century. This is, this is the experience of being human where we are right now. This is just what, this is what's going on. So this is why we're here and this is what we're here for. So for me, I, I mean, I like to take it from the human perspective, like we were talking earlier about the 10th ball. So, you know, there's the experience of pure consciousness and like you were saying, just detachment or like no opportunity and it's just everything's perfect and everything just is the ninth ball huh? <laughs> the ninth ball and then you know to 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 come around again to just being an ordinary person and now you're now you're free to be a person with no there's nothing wrong with being a person <laughs> let's just apologize you know because we don't know if there's really a ninth bull and a tenth bull and so if somebody feels like they're just into space and vastness uh, we're not trying to say you got one more step to go <laughs> Yeah, and, and who knows, maybe there's like 15 bowls. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I just mean like the, the part of what we're talking about where it comes back around again to just being a human, just being a person, um, but from, but, but freely. So you're free to be a person without identification or being stuck or being, you know, fixed in. And, and even if you do get fixed in a position, it's like, even that's okay. Like you can just go in and come right, right back out and just go right into it and come right back out of it. So it's like, I was really appreciating what Michael was saying about going to the protests and, and just going right into your reaction and sitting there and, and maybe feeling, you know, bitter about it, or maybe feeling great about it, but just to like, to just go right into the reaction and, and just come right out the other side and just letting it all be okay because it all is okay we're here we're here we're human there's no the, the the problem is when we make it a problem we we want something to be different than it is and then we resist what is and then and now we're into you know a struggle well isn't the protest wanting something different than it is yeah and don't, was... don't we all want it to you know in a way maybe we don't say it to ourselves but we would like a nice a nice country and uh egalitarian country with, where every, everybody had a, a decent uh, life and a decent uh, shot at life. I mean, yeah. I'm sure everybody would say they like that. Yeah, I think, I think the freedom comes in just seeing that for what it is and letting it be as it is. So even letting the wanting to be what it is. I want, I want freedom for everyone on the planet, but you don't have to be bound by that wanting. So it's just letting everything be as it is. Okay, let me share that my part then, because I'll jump right in too. So my part is like yesterday I was at Occupy Chicago, and I had my camera there, and I was like, had my camera up on my shoulder, and I did about nine or ten interviews with a wide variety of people. And uh, it was just totally amazing, totally amazing. I, uh, I spent so much time trying to get this uh, recording session here going that I didn't finish editing them, but I've edited about half of them. And I'm going to put them on my site, and I don't know, I don't get any comments. I put up something right on top about, and it said, coach people on Occupy New York, uh, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Chicago, post on their sites, you know. And, and uh, 
and why to post on their sites because uh, uh, you know maybe if some kind of a freedom is is you know you feel it uh, you know you could have a point of view that would be balanced and mm -hmm. uh, of course all these people uh, everyone has an, some kind of an emotional take on on how society works and so then everybody's got a different kind of a herd and so then everyone's got a different kind of an issue but basically what I see uh, beneath it all is just the fact that I think anyone every last person in the US I don't know about Canada too but uh, we would be willing to admit that uh, society is not really working all that well and it's not really balancing out you know like it's supposed to have checks and balances where it kind of comes back to center comes back to center you know by itself but it's just get it's it's gone into a thing that goes like this and then it's just kind of going off and off and off and off and who knows where it's going to go and the trust level has just gone down the tubes like uh, citizens that trust their processes and the government and the banking system and I mean, and uh, so then all I say is this is an opportunity to acknowledge that, hey, this is really not working for me. How about you? Mm -hmm. You know, and then we just all sit around and say, like, I mean, don't, shouldn't we send the message? Hey, you guys that are that we hire to to run this country and run this whole system, you know, yeah. have you noticed it's not really working? And besides, besides uh, your economic theory is flawed because the more you apply it, the uh, worse it seems to get. And so then let's go back to the drawing boards is basically what we're trying to do in the drawing boards, I think, is the is a 2012 platform. And we got to get uh, some kind of, you know, not just issues. I think we this is our our chance to kind of reform society and re, not reform, but uh, reformate yeah. or like, uh, you know, like uh, what do you call it? Re, uh, reform our uh, rebuild our uh, our model of society. If I could add anything to your both your brilliant uh, summaries here, it's that as much as there is this very healthy, normal, you know, human progression, we feel things that are upsetting and we act, and obviously we need to redesign our societies, and we are in the process of it, and it's outcome oriented, um, you know, it's it's progression and so forth. At the same time, as there is that strand of being, of, of perceiving of things, uh, there's also uh, another strand, which is completely equal. Uh, not, neither is above or, or sort of below the other in, in uh, wisdom. But that strand is everything is perfect as it is. You know, the demonstrations, whether this will turn out successful or not, um, it's all happening in a moment that is void of outcome. And, and I think, if anything, uh, as, as spiritual people, we tend to make the mistake of ending up along one strand of um, understanding or one strand of consciousness to the exclusion of all others. So we either end up too much in the moment and, and don't acknowledge that you know there's an outcome here and we can can change things and be humans and improve our surroundings uh, or we end up exclusively in this revolutionary spirit but we have to do something it's awful the way it is right now and mm -hmm. um, it's okay, nice to like to take it like this then uh, you know uh, a lot of uh, spiritual presenters uh, talk about the belief in, in, in a separate entity the belief in separation mm -hmm. and uh, so then everything is perfect the way it is out on a demonstration on the street on the street corner right but where that's a separation that puts me in my little cubby hole and uh i'm here and all every, all you guys are perfect out there you know and i'm perfect in here and that's how it is but really my participation is perfect too mm -hmm. you know and uh, my opportunity per to participate is perfect too something like that i mean uh uh how do, I, isn't there a uh, some kind of like uh, a risk that people can uh, just stay with separation and then say everything is perfect, but really it can be a detach. I think it can be used as almost like a defense mechanism, like it can be a detachment. But I think, like I really like what Michael's saying about this, the strands. Like I can, I see it sort of like a tapestry where it's like instead of saying like the, the whole thing about the vastness as one thing to, to weave the human experience into that as 
as as threads in a tapestry doesn't have to be a separation it, it's it's the mat it's the vantage point that you're looking at it from so if i'm looking at everything from pure consciousness and i'm saying not this not the human then I, in a way i can i can perceive that as a separation there's pure consciousness and then there's the human experience over there there are two things but from the vantage point as everything is consciousness and i'm watching form arise as that then i don't see a separation because i see everything as that same consciousness so that so from that vantage point there isn't separation even though i'm still saying the human experience is part of it do you know what i mean so it's not like there's two it depends on the vantage point so if i'm looking from pure consciousness nothing's happened yet it's just potential <laughs> and then i'm watching it arise i'm watching it become form it's made out of that same fabric it's like the tapestry of it so it is the same thing it's not it's not separate from it so now i can dive into the human experience and i can be i can be totally one with the human experience and i can get up in the morning and make my son lunch and i can just be a mom and just totally go right into the experience of humanity, there's no resistance, there's no reason not to. There's no problem with it. So then I can go to Occupy Wall Street and <laughs> sit down with my car or whatever, but it like, it, it's just, we're here to be human. So, you know, you're not bound, not bound by it. I think the freedom is seeing that, okay, I don't have to be identified with the human experience. And, and, maybe, and maybe part of the process is in pulling back and detaching, but then coming back around again to embody it, embodying it and embracing it. And now I can be fully human and die human experience. So like part of the experience you say is kind of uh, withdrawing and finding that space. And that's just kind of like, are you saying like an exaggeration so that you can make sure, oh, this is it, you know, <laughs> and then you just go into a quiet room, you know, and block out everything and then somehow, oh my God, I was, <laughs> this is always around, you know, and then realize it. Something well, like I that, or what? I think so. I, th I sometimes I think that the the experiential part is important. Like like sometimes I think of it like the like the awakening. Like so the the awakening experience where it's like oh my god everything is consciousness. Like as an experience, it's sort of like it's sort of like a like a marriage and a wedding day. So if I want to get married, if I put all of my attention on the wedding day, and let's say the wedding day is the awakening experience. And I put none of my attention on the marriage, the day-to-day, moment-to-moment interactions. Then I'm going to just be holding, or some people are like holding out for that experience. That's like putting all the attention on the wedding day instead of em embracing and embodying the entire marriage, which is, you know, the wedding is part of it, but it's not the only part. It's not the most important part. It's just a piece of it. And the important part is the totality of it, the whole. It's just the first step. So then maybe yeah. without that first step, there's no marriage. But yeah, after that first step. <laughs> but some people are like living common law. They've been together for 25 years and they never had them. So they still have marriage. <laughs> it's like some people are looking for that big bang awakening experience. And it's just, you know, they're already in the process because it slid in like that, you know, sort of without a big bang day, but they're still in the marriage. Because what's important about it is the relationship, is the day-to-day, -day, how the relating to life and to people and to your humanity and to consciousness, everything, all of it. Just to go back a little bit to separation, you know, because you, uh, you can say, okay, well, all, uh, so many religions are based on separation because I pray to God and I'm working to uh, have a behavior that pleases the Lord, and uh, I'm uh, I've surrendered to Jesus, and uh, um, I uh, you know I'm working on my self, my salvation, right? Mm -hmm. And the, we actually we're doing the same thing in the spiritual community because I I know I pin myself on that because I I I, I started to think about violent places in the world and how I have avoided them. And then, uh, and and then I was thinking about the pain in the world and how I've avoided that. And then there's so such easy uh, uh, explanations for that because I said, okay, well, uh, look, uh, how about my destiny or karma? I don't have any pain in my life, so my karma must be clean, clean of pain. You know, I just don't. Uh, so then, anyhow, 
why get involved and why mix it up, you know? So I was really building a wall of separation and saying that I'm searching for unity, you know, uh, unity consciousness or like I'm on the trail to, to no reality. And in the same way, I was conveniently saying that uh, you guys have pain, but I don't really have it, you know, because I'm kind of lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know, I confess. I give you absolution. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but in the midst of all these very healthy distinctions and, and uh, uh, you know, experiences and so forth, I feel that it's impossible to do anything wrong because uh, everything that we experience is part of the whole. Every Everything is whole in and by itself. So when we uh, avoid, it, it is just avoiding. Uh, it, it, there's no outcome in that sense. It doesn't lead us to be something. It's just something that happens in our system. We, we get scared. We... We lack in generosity, all these notions and, and self-reflections that happen, uh, they are whole. Uh, so uh, they're not mistakes or they're not part of some linear development whereby we have less and less of those negative things. Those negative things are actually perfect heart in and by themselves. And, and when everything, every direction we face, every thought we have, every action that we're part of uh, becomes uh, just whole, just what it is, then it's impossible to be wrong. Uh, we're just living whole uh, in, in every human experience. Uh, I think that's a little bit of the whole alchemy uh, illustration. When the lead of normal mundane human experience becomes gold, because there is no outcome, there is no meaning with it, it just is what it is, and that, that's what I'm experiencing. Well, I mean, uh, when it was happening that I was uh, thinking that karma, my karma was good, and, that, uh, <laughs> and I wasn't really thinking that I'm separate. I thought, no, I'm all one, but, you know, I'm on this end of the oneness. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, I wasn't noticing that. You know, I wasn't noticing that. And so then, now that I've noticed it, it seemed like a big deal to notice it. Oh, wow, and that was tricking me. And then now things are changing. I'm more and more willing to uh, uh, look into pain and to see, well, what is this energy of, what is this energy of injustice and, and so on? Because I've kind of, I haven't really crashed this good karma or whatever. But I mean, what I'm saying is there is a kind of a linear progression because I, now I'm different because now I notice all the time. I, I mean, the cat's out of the bag on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it does make a big difference to to bring something like that into conscious awareness because then it's once it's seen, it's sort of like, oh, that's not a big deal. But when you don't see it, it can it can be it can be perceived as a big deal. Well, I but, mean, even also vice versa, it's not a big deal when you don't see it because you just think you, it's not even happening, you know. But then when you realize, hey, it's happening, and I was doing it all the time, <laughs> and uh, now that I see it, I mean, I at least I have a. You know, I can say um, uh, I'm not such a hypocrite anymore because I can see that mm, yeah. that now I'm uh, uh, responsible. Yeah. In a different way. Yeah, and then you get to the point where you can kind of laugh at it. Yeah, I laugh at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't that cute. I thought it was an ego. <laughs> I thought it was separate. Oh, silly me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like um, to touch on what Michael was saying about the totality and even that I actually don't like to use the word ego but like what you were saying about the you know the, the sense of separation I was seeing it one day sort of like um, you know like a, like a masterpiece of creation like a painting or something and all the shadows are part of the whole but if we're looking at it from the perspective of all those shadows are, are bad and we have to take them out. It actually changes the whole picture. But it's, it, if the whole picture is embraced, it's like, oh, that's just a piece of the whole. It's just the, it's just the shading there. Yeah. Without shadows, it'll get pretty flat. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, Richard said it, without shadows, it would get very flat. And, and that's, a, that's a great summary. I mean, it's rich to have all these yeah, human exactly. shortcomings, as we used to term them now. It's actually the glimmering soul. It's part of the totality, and it's beautiful. 
<laughs> so I got some Occupy Wall Street right up on top of my website, you know, and it's not really getting any comments. <laughs> and I don't know, you know, people are kind of shocked. I guess, what is this guy turning into? He's an activist now. And uh, now it's going to get worse because I'm, you know, I'm going to put some videos up there because I'm the next time I get a chance, I'll go out there and uh, it's working really good. To, and, the, and there's so many different uh, points of view and so many people out there. All the citizens are out there. Every uh, facet of the diamond. I even talked to one guy. He was a trader because uh, they they mar they their headquarters are right there in front of the board of trade. You know, like the commodities trading. And uh, he was giving me his take. And then uh, one guy came in from Colorado and says, I wanted to see what this Occupy thing was. <laughs> All the way for, flew in, you know. <laughs> I think that's really good, actually. I think it's, you know, it'll, it, it, the less that you know, the more of the big picture you can see. So I was just kind of seeing it like, like if, if I was an alien and I was just, I had no idea about any of it, I could have a huge perspective. So I'm kind of seeing that about all your different videos, how they can all just, <laughs> it can be a way to give people the big, <laughs> pan back and see the bigger piece of the pie here. <laughs> Christine, did you say if you were an alien? <laughs> yeah. mm. she's, she's Canadian, you know, so does that count? <laughs> I love those Canadians, I tell you. <laughs> They're the best. <laughs> yeah. Now, but for what it's worth, now that you're really bringing this Occupy exposure to your own website, um, I came to realize that part of my um, aversion to it was simply that it's so chaotic. All kinds of people just show up. They just put their bodies in the street. It's sort of anarchic, intrinsically anarchistic. Uh, but there's plenty of chaos, and much of it is coming from uh, the heart level. People are just upset in their emotions, so to speak. And, and I was out jogging and sort of processing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and an interesting historical uh, aspect came to mind, how segregation once was resolved back in the 50s of the United States. You, have, you had an, uh, a leadership, sort of elitist segment of society who would argue that neither we nor the Negroes, quote unquote, are ready for this transition. Like it has to be gradual, it has to be engineered, designed, and managed. Uh, and of course, that was the establishment trying to keep things the way they were. And then you had the people that went out in the streets and just did dumb things, but did dumb things uh, sort of from the body's level, from emotions. They did not reason, they were not in a position to reason. Uh, and I think that's how you change things or, or that's in part how things change on this planet it's not always intellectual comprehensive you know from this level sometimes it's just bodies in the street the chaos of it uh, and i found myself as a male also to to be uh, averse to the chaos aspect of this which is if you want to classify you know if you want to characterize things chaos is a little more of a feminine quality uh, guys like things to be more orderly or controlled, perhaps. You know, I, I'm generalizing now, but so. well, you know, if it's intellectual and if it's not chaotic, it's been taken over. Somebody's co-opted it, and somebody's mm -hmm. saying, "Oh, well, uh, I'll just use this, uh, all these people, and I'll kind of calm them down and tell them I'm doing their thing for them, and uh, mm -hmm. I'll use it for my own ends." And uh, I think that uh, some other things have uh, been co-opted like that. And uh, my experience is just going out of there. It is chaotic and everybody, you know, some and nobody's an intellectual out there. Some think they are and some think they have a, a quick fix. And uh, I'm just cautioning that, uh, you know, we don't need a quick fix. We just have to say that the system's broken. And, mm -hmm. uh, and when you go out there and, and when you look at my videos, if I do some more of them, you'll find out that who's they, you know, they are us. You know, because there's one of each out there, you know, at least. And uh, I mean, uh, I'll tell you one heartfelt story. This is a beautiful story. I mean, this guy is just a um, huge heart, you know. He says, I, I, for nine months now, I've been out of prison. I was in 26 years. I'm 43 years old. They didn't put me on parole. They just let me go. So there's nothing for me out here. Uh, I was a foster kid. I made a lot of wrong decisions. 
Uh, I have, uh, they gave me $25 and a ticket to, a bus ticket to Chicago and uh, I'm on, here I am on the street. And um, uh, in one sense, I'm homeless, I don't have a key, but I'm, I don't act like homeless, you know, and I'm trying to make the right decisions. And he's saying, the only thing I know is to love God. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm coming out here because I know what these people are doing is a bigger picture than me. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm representing those, my brothers that are locked up. And, uh, but he's got no place to go, really. And, uh, you know, no Head Start, no halfway house, no work release program. Uh, they just uh, dropped him like an egg and said, good luck, we'll see you in a month or two, you know, when you get back here. And uh, basically, it's uh, horrendous. It's just a horrendous thing that, uh, you know, we're, we do routinely. And then we just say, see, criminals are really criminals because of the recidivism. Yeah, as you're pointing out, there are obviously great systemic uh, issues, not just in this country, but in all countries. But, I mean, which civilization has ever been perfect? You know? so, um, <laughs> it's part of the chaos. <laughs> yeah. But even the chaos, too. I mean, depending on the vantage point that you're looking at something like chaos, that can be seen as total perfection. Like if you were looking at mold grow in a petri dish and you like watched it on fast forward, how depending on which angle you're looking at could appear really chaotic to the mold spores. But <laughs> if you're looking at it from up here, it's like, oh, that's so beautiful. Look how it's all har harmoniously flowing together. So it's the same with this chaos that's happening with the humans on the planet. It's like... <laughs> doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing it's depend it's how you're looking at it what what label you're sticking on top of it depending on if you have a, an outcome that you prefer then it you know it's going to rub up against that if you don't if you're just watching it it's just isn't <laughs> order you know order talking about order and chaos isn't order mm -hmm. uh like a mental operation you know somebody ordered it right we put it in an order and so that's all really uh, just a thought. Order is a thought. In reality, I, what happens when you're uh, you're in the wide open spaces? I mean, uh, I don't mean in Wyoming. I just mean in your your own consciousness. I mean, is there mm -hmm. any chaos or is there any order? There's neither. Is there? Yeah, neither or both, right? At the same time, sometimes. Yeah, I, I would say it's just all harmonious. It's all just you know, like the mold growing in the dish kind of thing. So harmony, what does harmony mean compared to chaos? Is there a difference? I Personally, I would see them as the same thing, but I'm sure someone out there is going to argue that there's a huge difference. <laughs> like the, just the, I almost see it like a fractal. Like it's just, you know, like a, a planet spinning around a sun and a moon spinning around a planet. These, these are just forces that are happening. If you have... If you have a, a mechanism that says, I want to control the way that the earth is spinning and I want to make the moon go around the planet this way to try to make it, you know, order. Well, you know, we don't have the power to do that. It's just happening. So the whole thing about order, I think it's just like it's a desire to have control, which we don't really have. That's personal opinion, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all things taken into consideration, I think it's nice uh, never to end up in one one view, one view to the exclusion of any other view. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What we're talking about, it can all be taken as individual truths, and, and I don't think there is one. You know, it's all just nice, a nice mix of human experiences and uh, yeah. uh, ultra, uh, you know, um, over human experiences, as the case might be. Um, well, okay, I like the what you're saying is it kind of keeps it really loose, you know, instead of being sort of fixed in one place, it's just kind of like, oh, just sort of open. Mm -hmm. This guy says that, this guy says this. <laughs> I, and you know how it is. You, you can really appreciate a human being who's completely locked down on a certain notion, a certain understanding. You can really uh, feel uh, uh, an unconditional uh, appreciation or love of what that people, 
what that person is experiencing, who they are, without the notion of they having to loosen up and, and be more um, open-minded. Because that's the creation that's happened there. That person is having that experience, being that entity at that particular point. Yeah, um, they just are who they are, too. Yet many people, uh, you know, we call them non-duality present presenters. <laughs> <laughs> Many people, you know, coach uh, persons that, you know, may, because uh, not only do we can we respect those people, and but we can see that they're suffering. And they might even be screaming and saying, I'm suffering, I'm suffering. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I mean, uh, well, maybe uh, in uh, spiritual speak, we're not willing to say there's a difference between clenchedness and openness or like uh, anxiety and peace. And uh, I mean, it. Yeah, you know, at one time it seemed like it was okay to say that because uh, the world was really flexible and uh, it would uh, absorb all that. But it doesn't even seem like the world on the planet Earth is willing to absorb that much uh, tightness anymore. I'm not so sure, but I mean, there's a lot of things that it doesn't seem to want to absorb. Uh, uh, wars and uh, and uh, and pollutive streams and uh, and uh, what they call uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are these. I, sorry, sorry. Can I think? Yeah, I was saying that there are these high-level systemic uh, um, tendencies. Or right now, we seem to be in a in a vogue of uh, awakening and so forth. Um, and, and some people are ready for it; others are not. Uh, I I think that. Um, sort of God, the very popular word, you know, reality cares little about what enlightenment goes on or what goes not on. I don't think uh, awakening or enlightenment is a particularly, uh, you know, crowning creation type event. It's just something that happens. It's spit it out uh, in the system. Um, it's not like it's the purpose of, of creation because that, uh, levy such a burden on those that are not there or are progressing along uh, the line of you know awakening somewhere i i think it's all extremely equal to the extent that even enlightenment is like who cares what would all that right, burden be some... what would that burden be well you you impose a certain certain timeline okay so you you know how uh, someone who's spiritually savvy or mature can just talk with someone and see how their mind structures are, where, how much they self-reflect or echo inside of them, so to speak. And then you can draw the conclusion that, oh, so they are here on their way to here or put things in a context of awakening or whatever, while as um, everything, I mean, really everything is perfect. And there is no thing that is more perfect than any other. Things do not lead to awakening necessarily. It just happens. It's something that this whole machinery is churning out. At, well, you know, uh, maybe somebody that's really, let's say, uh, somewhat awake or somewhat open doesn't mm -hmm. really operate with conclusions. You know, yeah. and that's not the outcome of, of uh, seeing somebody as a conclusion. In right. fact, what the outcome usually is is that tight mindset uh, relaxes and loosens up a little bit, and uh, the sharing somehow uh, relieved uh, uh, a brother's pain, you know, a brother's pain, which is my pain. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Yeah, I think I think it's like if you're looking at it from a like Michael said, a linear trajectory. If you're if you're looking from that vantage point within the stream of the linear, if you were to flip that entire thing over to looking at it there's no linear time and just looking at it from the vantage point of like a non-linear awareness for lack of a better word there you're just here so there's no outcome or i've got to get there so it's when you're looking at it from inside that particular stream which not to say that that's a problem either but just mm -hmm. you know when you are inside that stream and you're saying oh i've got to do this and then i get to that and then i'll go over here and then that'll lead to that when you were asking yeah. what the burden was, it's like, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, that's perfect. Because I, I, I hear so many people who are sort of in the ascending um, state of mind. You know, they're going somewhere. Uh, and I think that's 
might be one of the uh, more heavier and long lasting traps, so to speak, of, of, of becoming. I know that's the speech, spiritual seeker mm -hmm. experience. And, and what I said. It's just part of the totality. Like the, the linear stream is part of how we operate as a human being. But to be able to incorporate both, you know, a non linear vantage point you know then you then you can like like what you were saying earlier richard about how it is it is linear because <laughs> we are human so they're like they're both it's it's sort of like how the totality gets woven together rather than saying it's got to be one or the other i've got to get over here into non-linear and stay over there it's like well, yeah but you're you're also a human and it is linear that i get up in the morning and make my son a lunch and then send him to school <laughs> It is, you know, it's experienced that way, but to be able to, but to see it from the totality. When you see from the totality, I mean, is there any reason uh, not to involve? Not to involve? Correct. That's the question. I would say no. I, I would say that's the whole point that you, there, there's no reason not to say feel pain or there's no aversion to it because you see it for what it is. So it's just something fleeting that comes and goes. So there's no need to, to shrink away from pain. And I think that's helpful. Like you were saying, if you meet a person who's really suffering and they're saying, help me, help me, help me, I'm suffering. If you're in, a, in an, an open space where you don't have an aversion to pain because you can see it for what it is, you can, you can meet that person, you can just go mesh with them and, and intuitively connect and, and meet them and hold their pain with them. And yet there's no, there's no, there's nothing inside the thing, I've got to get them out of this pain, because you're okay, there's no reason to not feel it or to shrink back from it. When yeah, you're but in. you're going to know also 99% of the times when you reacted with someone or acted with somebody like that, uh, they did relax, right? And you're mm -hmm. not, so then you, I, whether you expect it or not, you know, you can say, well, that's fine. But I mean, and uh, I don't hit 100%, you know, but anyhow. <laughs> yeah, some people aren't ready to let it go yet, which is okay, too. Yeah. They might still be getting something out of that. And then it's just not time for them to let it go. So, and, and it, but if I had, if I had an aversion to pain, and, and I really wanted them to be free, you know, then I would start you know, trying to tinker with them and manipulate them and fix them. But if I can see it for what it is, it's like, okay, they're okay. They're not ready to let that go yet, but they will be. <laughs> and I'll be here with them, you know, be here for them through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, and we've all come across uh, uh, people with the capacity to dissolve various emotional um, uh, programs and so forth. Uh, which is unfortunate in a sense. Only now have I been led back to all these emotions, of which many are difficult, but you, you're led back to them only to realize how wonderful they actually are. Mm -hmm. And uh, while it's possible to, to cleanse, so to speak, or dissolve uh, these shades that go on inside, that's, that's a real loss. Uh, and I see a lot of uh, spiritual practices involving just that sort of healing or dissolving or ascending from rather than dropping into. And um, that it's a treasure to be had. Can it be that uh, once they're dissolved uh, and there's that clear space and that perspective and then uh, uh, a greater readiness to go back into? Because when, when we're in it, we're so caught up in the whole thing that we don't really see it for what it is, right? And then by having that clear space and then they dissolve and then you leave that teaching or whatever and and then you're somehow things come back at you and, and they even come back stronger because you're willing to let them come in you know you're not so scared you don't zig and zag so much and uh, uh, maybe that's uh, that's has given you a perspective that you can see them for what they really are yeah yeah and, and in the way that I see it it's it's more like it's diffused into the totality it's not like it's not extracted so like an analogy I often tell my friends is like if you have a glass bottle sitting in a pool with red food coloring in it and the pool is the totality, it's like to to contain something is when it's like really intense. So to contain the red food coloring, it's intense. 
But if I if I were to dissolve the glass, the red food coloring would still be there, but it would be diluted. So it's like you can't really say I'm gonna ex I, I'm taking it out. I'm not ever gonna feel angry again because where you know where would you put it? Where's the outside of oneness? You know, <laughs> where to <did it> go? <laughs> but it's it's that ownership that like the actual containing of it that makes that's the, why it's perceived as so intense and unpleasant and. I got to get out of here. I got to get away from it. I don't like it. But if it's not owned, if it's if it's not contained, it's just it's diluted. It's diffused. It's still there. But so it's anyhow, if you if you say uh, I, I'm I can't uh, not say I cannot say that I'm not going to feel anger again. But I could say that I'm not going to believe in it again. <laughs> <laughs> or own it. Yeah. Own it. Yeah. Okay. Believe in it is mine. Yeah. Exactly. And it's just there in the oneness. It's just part of the panorama what's a belief is there such a thing what is a belief yeah well I, I guess I would say that it's the condition like the conditioning like 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 say good and bad like if I had if I had a notion the the full moon is good and a new and the new moon is bad and then I you know, kind of developed in a personal attachment to that. And then I walk down the street and I see the moon is full. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm good today. I'm, I'm on. Look at that. The moon is full. And then two weeks later, I walk down. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully swear words, swear words are welcome here. <laughs> And then as I walk down the street and the moon is new, oh, I'm bad. You know, I haven't, I haven't done it right. Cause so I would say that it's, it's that, it's that attaching to a label, like a mental label. This is good and that's bad. And then how we get conditioned, like as a society, there's advertisements that say, you know, skinny is good and overweight is bad. So that's a, that's a belief system. Like if I was the, if I was an alien and I just kind of came to visit earth, I don't, and I'm totally unconditioned. I don't know anything. <laughs> how, would I know, how would I know if overweight is bad? Is she's good. proving <laughs> something. I think she's kind of onto something there. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. No, but we don't have to say good and bad because we could say you know, like one has more opportunity and one uh, has less opportunity, like the full moon. Or we could say one is the way the world really works, you know, like gravity, and one is not, you know, uh, flying. Levitating only happens in a yoga studio. <laughs> 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 But anyhow, sometimes now, how about this? Because like sometimes what we call a belief, people say this. Anyhow, I don't know if you want to put or add this into your definition that uh, some things are like not noticed. Okay, uh, and not noticed is a code word for being unconscious because it's not in the consciousness, not noticed. So then, uh, can beliefs be not noticed? Yeah, for sure. I think. I mean, we feel them eventually because. It, it hurts to have something that's unconscious inside. I think that's one of the ways in which uh, consciousness integrates. It hurts to have something separate. It pushes against you, which might not be so uncomfortable. Then you keep neglecting it and pushes harder and it rubs and it causes friction and blisters inside up until, you know, it, it merges, re-merges. Yeah, that's just because you're not noticing it, right? And because it just keeps operating, and you keep bumping into, the, you go that the wrong in the way that would bump into that thing, and uh, and yeah. uh, and so then you bump harder and harder. Is that what you're saying? Right. But maybe a gentler way of saying it would be that it's not noticed because it's so easy to, uh, in subtle ways, get self berating, like, "Oh fuck, I'm not noticing this." Now I said, "Fuck, that's worse than shit." Um, <laughs> uh, 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 you, you know, I, I I'm so stupid. I'm not noticing this. You know, I'm uh, I spend more time uh, watching TV than I or on Facebook than I am actually sitting down and trying to feel these things. So I'm failing in my sort of spiritual mobility. Although I I say that I value my introspection so much. So you make a, a personal process out of this 
spiritual process that happens on its own. And now we're entering a completely different discussion whether things happen on its own or whether we have a part in it. But I find oftentimes it's almost like a fire with smoke. Uh, we are the smoke. You know, we go to satsangs or we meditate or we have breakthroughs and we think that we are part of it. But that's the smoke. The fire itself is just happening. And then it, it comes up to mental levels whereby we become conscious of, of new levels of ourselves. But it's already happened. And it happens on some very impersonal level. Uh, not to say that it excludes the personal. Uh, but Let's stay with to... that a little more and kind of uh, really understand what you're saying. Because I think you're, I, I have a hint that I have a feeling that's a great metaphor. Like uh, the fire is somehow the non-doing that's just happening. And the smoke is somehow like the evidence of, the, of what, what, what is just coming up and when that smoke rises it to the level of the intellect we make an interpretation out of it and it and that interpretation is uh, is cast in a in a time frame and the time frame looks like uh, motion and doing and all that stuff it, it, that's the illusion of of uh, how it looks like uh, and so the, is something like that are you saying or uh, elaborate that one because it sounds yeah, it's great almost, it's almost like saying that I was enlightened you know it, it happens uh, it strikes or it, it molds its own um, um, parts in this creation. Um, you know, like the hen and the egg, which comes first? Did I go to a satsang retreat and spend time with this or that uh, awake person so that I became awake? Or, or did that just happen and, and, and the satsang time uh, uh, was just, um, uh, it was the stage, it was the, the, the physical expression of it but I mean, this starts to sound philosophical so we should stop it here I think it's important not to make a distinction the, the human experience of awakening is as legitimate it is same as that fire which maybe cannot be perceived there's no distinction between our reflections the reflection itself is reality so the reflection and the fire and the smoke and it's all the same, right? And, yeah, and somehow we're 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 separating it by our our conceptual languaging, and uh, just as if the, just as a chicken and an egg are the same thing. There's no chicken without an egg, and no egg without a chicken, and so it's the, actually the, the same thing. The only the only value of perhaps turning this coin, turning the table, and say and pointing at fire versus smoke, smoke versus fire, is perhaps that it can neutralize a misperception that is polar opposite. Neither of them is true. It's not like one way of modeling this is more true than the other. Uh, but if, as I find many people have ended up in one camp, it's nice to point out uh, the impersonal aspect of this process, because uh, at least it was the case for me, uh, and maybe still is, that uh, you know, I take great responsibility for this, and I see the actions or behavior in me that lead to a deepening. Except perhaps that's a, a gross misperception. Perhaps the event is happening, and then, as you you said, I'm I'm reflecting on my personal uh, experience. So, and 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 back again to what you talked about in regards to beliefs. You know, having beliefs and whatnot. I think we should have. We should have tons of beliefs and enjoy it. Um, it's not like it's going to hurt uh, or, or change um, the essence of things. I, I think Christine described it real well. I mean, it's like this chaos. Life is is uh, uh, it's just a, 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 a multitude of events, and maybe we freeze a, a, a cube out of this unformally event stream. And, and then we have opinions about that frozen block of life in which part, that's like a belief. It is this way or that way. But why discard that? Why, why call it less than any other event, any other joy we can get out of um, reality? You know? So when you say like a cube, then uh, it kind of means like a, a belief is a snapshot, something taken out of the river of life, and it's just uh, frozen. You know, and even if it was close at one time, it's probably getting farther and farther away because it's it doesn't move. Yeah. It has no totally. moving, no life to it. Yeah, totally ridiculous. It's it's relative. It's uh, local. Uh, it says nothing about reality. 
in particular, but it's fun. Maybe it's, you know, <laughs> maybe, it <can> <laughs> maybe it's, a, maybe it's hell too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But everything is fun and beautiful from a conscious perspective or a conscious experience. And, and, and we go to, uh, to Disneyland. Why not have fun with beliefs? You know? <laughs> as old as I, as much as I've been around the, the map, I never went to Disneyland. I got outside the fence <laughs> once or twice, but <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what I'm speaking for here is to, to relax some of that orthodox seeking uh, that I have been doing so much myself, you know, or watch out for beliefs or, you know, we, we, we distinguish between parts. Uh, 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 and I think it's, it's time to relax those things and let everything in and beliefs, you know, love affairs, cars, healthy eating, political activism, um, uh, hostile takeovers of fortune thousands, you know, allow it all. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to shoot another question here. Like, what's a tendency? Who wants to go on that one? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I'm up. <laughs> I, I would say it's probably the same as a habit. Yeah. So something that you're like, just something you habitually do without, like, I think like what Michael was saying about noticing, I think that's, um, anything habitual, like if it's not in conscious awareness and you're not making a conscious choice, then it's sort of in the realm of a tendency or a habit or unconsciousness or whichever word you want to use to describe it. But it's like, it's like if you were looking into a mirror and you were looking at your face, and you are fixated on your face and maybe you even have, you know, a certain habit that you're looking at your face through, like, you know, am I, you know, is my hair long enough? Is it sure? You know, are those sort of beliefs. Well, one habit is you're always looking to left, to right, to left and left to right. <laughs> That's kind of, who's that guy? <laughs> so if you're, but if you're like, so, so for, to, to explain the tendency thing, like if you're, if, if there's something that you don't notice, it could be like, say, the glass of the mirror. It's something that you don't notice because you're looking at your face. It's not to say that it's not there. It's just bypassed because you're fixated somewhere else. Your attention is somewhere else. So anything that's like, uh, that's just, it's not noticed. But it so it's a habit that's not noticed? What's that? It's a habit that's not noticed? Yeah, it, well, anything that's not noticed. It's just not, the attention just isn't on it. Well, I mean, anything, if it doesn't repeat, it's not a tendency, right? It has to be something to repeat, so it has to be a habit, doesn't it, to be a tendency? I would say so. I would say, I would keep, I would have them interchangeable. A habit and a tendency and, and unconsciousness are sort of all kind of the same thing. But as soon as it's noticed, as soon as I put my attention on the glass, it's like, oh, look at that. That's that's right there. It's, it's never not been there. It's always been there but my attention was over there so i didn't see it so as soon as it's soon as it's in as soon as it's brought to conscious awareness like what you were like what you were sharing about about the separateness thing as soon as it's noticed it's like oh look at that there it is now it's not unconscious anymore you have your consciousness is right on it you can put your attention right on it yeah and then, it could still be a tendency or could still be a pattern but at least i'm conscious of it and then i can decide each time you know then you, do i yeah. really want to and gradually i could maybe uh, pull the fuse on it you know and just say exactly. like let me try it out a little at a time because i don't want to just plunge into the world pain but uh, yeah yeah it's then it's a conscious choice so it's like i can consciously choose to do it or to not do it but either way it's now it's noticed so it's Whereas when it wasn't noticed, it maybe was a pattern that drove you. And maybe, you know, oh, yeah. you were... Like, it could have frustrated me too, because I was always thinking like, why am I always like this? And every time I try it, and I do all those things they tell me, and I visualize, and I make affirmations, and I do all kinds of study, and, and it's back yeah. again. There it comes. Hello, Tennessee. Yeah, I really, I the, key is just, the key is just in a little bit of willingness. It's just, 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 just be willing to look at it. And because I think these things, I think sometimes we have a little bit of a shame charge on it. It's like, I don't, I don't really want to look at that because I'm embarrassed about it or, or whatever. Like if it's a, if it's some kind of like unconscious pattern, but if you're just a little bit willing to look, to bring it up and look at it, it's, it's just all of a sudden it's not a big, it might be a big deal for a second, but then it's not really a big deal anymore. And now it's, 
now it's seen. It's more of a big deal when you're protecting it. Like if, if somebody's sort of triggering you or poking at it and, you know, mm -hmm. you're like, I don't want to look at that. <laughs> so then as soon as you're willing, as soon as you're willing to pull it up and look at it, now it's noticed. So now, you know, it's just not a big deal anymore. Yeah. And that, to add to that, which I think is a, is a great summary, uh, I, I've experienced, as I think everyone has, you know, years of not being aware of the tendencies, you know, you, whatever it is, career or relationships, we have very cyclic tendencies. We get back together with type, with the right. same type of character. Um, and then we have a couple of years whereby we increase our conscious uh, potential or capacity thanks to meditation or awareness exercises. And we start to try to uh, change these tendencies. Uh, and then I think we have uh, another couple of years of extreme frustrations whereby the tendencies come back despite, despite our best efforts. Uh, and, and the final phase of this, uh, at least in my experience, has been an amusement, how the tendencies can be so damn strong. Uh, that, and I'm definitely uh, uh, defeated by them. Uh, and maybe the point of this is it's nice not to go to war against the tendencies, but just be naturally curious about these very strong forces. Uh, and maybe the strongest tendencies we have around us are, you know, planetary movements, you know, planets and soul, uh, solar systems that operate in gravitational patterns, just definitely a very uncompromising type of tendency, if you can call it that. Um, and, and as Christine was saying, once we uh, get conscious, curious enough to actually become aware of these tendencies, maybe they don't have to go away. Uh, you know, they've lost their impact. They can't fool us any longer, but they yeah. can still stay there. I have a feeling that if yeah. we really saw it, you know, they couldn't even, there was no possibility that they could stay, you know, they would be just, they realize that they're nothing. And uh, I don't know, sometimes I, I, it comes to me to explain tendencies through unconscious beliefs. I don't know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, what drives us to, uh, to behave? Is like we think the world is like this and this is what we should be doing? Well, and also the, also the conflictedness, I think, also fuels it. Like if I want to be a teacher, but really I'm supposed to be a gas station attendant and, you know, those two, those two things would conflict inside. And it's like, no, I want to be this, and I should be that. And what do you mean should or supposed to be a gas attendant? What do you mean should? Yeah, no, I, I, that's not very maybe just a because good my dad was uh, has got a gas station and I'm supposed to be running it for him or what? <laughs> no, okay, scratch that one. <laughs> like I mean, more like a more like an actual like tendency, like a, like a, I would call it an archetype. Like let's say I've got like a teacher archetype and I've got a mother archetype. And there's a belief that they can't both be there. I have to identify with one or the other. And then there's a conflict. And there's conflicting energies. It's the conflict that feed, that fuels the whole thing. And really, I'm not either of them. I'm just the potentiality or the consciousness or whatever you want to call it. But and they can both they can actually both peacefully, you know, I can I can jump into one role and then the other and then back to nothing and then, you know, as appropriate. But it's the, it's when they're conflicted that you know I shouldn't be this way or I shouldn't be this way. That's what sort of keeps it as like a agitation or fueling it as a discomfort. Of course, an unconscious belief just means and and which operates a tendency just means we're not noticing it. So then, yeah, I think uh, once, they're, once they're noticed, these like you know if you want to call them archetypes or whatever, once they're noticed, then. You know, they they can be there. They might they may fall away, but they may they may conscious may use it consciously. Like so, there's not to say that it's a problem for it to even be there. Well, I mean, you know, you, I I think you can look at every last person on the planet Earth and say they have tendencies. You know, yeah. You know, but no matter who they are and how enlightened they are or whatever it is, you know, they've got a personality, and some of them are damn strong. I mean, if it, if it were true that when you reach enlightenment, the personality falls away, then we would all look exactly like like Ramana. You know, we'd all be you know sitting there in the. Well, he's got seat. a tendency too. Yeah, so exactly. So the so it just the the personality doesn't go. Otherwise, we would wake up and then we would all become this identical 
you know, cookie cut out of Nizagar daughter or whoever. Yeah, but yeah, these tendencies, where are they parked, you know? Where where do they where's their home? Because like Where would you go? Yeah. Where's the outside of oneness for it to go oh, yeah. to? <laughs> because if it's all oneness and you know, like I mean somehow the tendencies uh prefer like one to uh Christine tendency prefers to hang around your house and uh Richard tendency prefers to hang around my house and mm -hmm. uh somehow it seems like it's parked in this unconscious you know which is not really a place it's just that part that we're not noticing that part of the whole that we're not noticing maybe or I don't know is there such a thing as unconsciousness I think I think it's just like Michael said. I think it's just not noticed. It's 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 just something as simple as it's just not noticed. It's just a code word that means not noticed. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there's almost like too much meaning placed on unconsciousness, and then it's like this bad thing. It's like, but it's really just the simple basic. Where is your attention? What are you focusing on? You know, it's like it's like the, the mirror and the glass thing. If I'm looking at my face, I don't notice the glass. It's it's just because of where my attention is. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's just I'm not looking at it. I'm looking I at something. <laughs> it's also good to remember that when we are unconscious on a large scale throughout our lives or just for the day or for the moment, it's supposed to be that way. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's again, uh, a, a, a bit of a dangerous spot where people tend to get personal about where they're at, like deep. I, I was unconscious again now, you know, but, but everything yeah. is orchestrated exactly. perfectly, you know, so you should almost cherish the moments when you're unconscious and, uh, you know, inflicting wounds on yourself or some, uh, some other people. It's, it, yeah. it's supposed to be that way. So yeah. it's, those are really hard words, you know, because when you say supposed to, and then when you say perfect, Perfect seems to me uh, very much related to uh, imperfect, you know, it's like as opposed yeah. uh, in relationship to, you know, supposed to, I don't know what that is, because we always, sh uh, we never, we hate to say should, because if you're saying should or something like that, you're really, uh, uh, you're a mental being, right? I mean, and so it's not really supposed to, but that's some words uh, that are given to somebody that is uh, supposing, I guess. I don't know. What, tell me another word. There must be a better one than that. Well, let's, let's say everything is in the right place. <laughs> yeah, and I should be going to an appointment here in five minutes. Five? You're going to give us five? <laughs> but I and should, I have I... a yoga class to teach tonight. <laughs> So we are having too much fun, right? I mean, uh, what can you do? Uh, what a grand discussion. I don't know. We really, we're really we not going to solve all the world's problems, so then this is a perfect time to cop out, right? <laughs> so, everybody, thank you so much. Michael Hedman, right? You just came in the last minute. I can't remember. Yeah, well, it was quite apropos. I was surprised myself to see my Skype calling here, but it's been wonderful to meet you. All right, Michael Hedman, everybody, and uh, Christine Wuschke, and uh, Richard Miller over here, <laughs> and uh, all you guys. You, I can't show you you, but you know, I wished I could. But <laughs> but thanks for coming here anyhow, and uh, check in on our next uh, uh, you know installment, and also go all to all those Occupy websites and write your wisdom down there. And I know you got a lot. Okay, <laughs> thanks and bye. 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 Bye, Michael. Goodbye.